My name is Mike Albu, if you're not already aware of that. I'm the director of the Beam Exchange, which is a platform for knowledge exchange and learning about market systems development. We're part of the, uh, the, um, the wider organization called the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development, if you're not familiar with that, an organization that uh, represents, has members from uh, most of the, the bilateral funding agencies and a few uh, foundations as well. So the Beam Exchange is, as I mentioned, a platform for knowledge exchange and learning. And one of the things we offer is this facility called Grab the Mic Webinars where organizations that are doing interesting work related to market systems development can uh, either present or showcase their, their, their learning or their, their activities to the community. And today, I'm very glad to be able to welcome Fabio Giuseppe from the World Bank. Unfortunately, his colleague, Samyana, uh, is, unable, is going to be unable to join us, very sadly. She's, she's been caught up with some sort of family emergency and uh, Fabod is going to stand in and uh, cover her, her section of the webinar. But um, let me tell you a little bit about Fabod. He's the program coordinator for the World Bank's Agriculture and Food Global Practice. Uh, and he co-leads the Enabling the Business of Agriculture activity, which is what he's going to be talking about today, the EBA. And he also serves as a technical lead for the practices food loss and post-harvest management agenda. So a very, very experienced uh, gentleman to speak to us today about the uh, EBA uh, tool and, and its value potentially for us as market system development practitioners. Um, so uh, since we now have 16 people in the room, Farbod, maybe I think it's time and it was three minutes past 10, we can hand over to you. Just before I do though, I'd just like to point out a couple of features of this platform that we're using for the webinar. Um, in particular, you'll see in the bottom right hand corner, there's a, a box called chat. And that is a place where you can put comments or questions if, you, if you're having any difficulties. It's also where we will post questions. So after Fabod has spoken uh, for about 25 minutes, he tells me, there's going to be plenty of opportunity for questions and answers. So if you have questions, please put them into that chat box. You can, um, if you click on the little tiny gray question mark icon, um, it'll pop those questions straight into the Q&A mode question box and then we can access them more easily. But don't worry if you don't see that because if you write them as a message, you can tag them as questions later. But that's the place to look for questions. And as I say, Farbod is going to talk for about 25 minutes uh, before we have the questions. I don't think there's anything else I need to, uh, to do in terms of getting this ball rolling. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Farbod, and welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, good morning to you and to all our participants and listeners uh, in this room, as we call it. The world has become a room. Uh, and um, good morning or afternoon to all of you, depending on where you are. I don't imagine we have any anybody connecting from a good evening area, but uh, for sure, good morning from here in Washington, DC. I'm assuming that uh, you can hear me okay, Mike? I'm hoping I'm being heard. Yeah, we can, we can hear you very well, Pablo. sorry. Perfect. No worries. Very good. Well, it's um, it's my pleasure. Again, apologies on behalf of my colleague, Samjana Tapa. Uh, something happened uh, with the family that she's had to take care of overnight, um, but happy to, to share this with you on behalf of our team, this project called Enabling the Business of Agriculture, um, which is a project which has been going uh, for about seven years now. Um, both of us, both Samjan and I, have been part of the project. I've been coordinating the project since its inception uh, and very happy to share this with you. Um, you know, I might go ahead and start out with a slide about something you're, you're widely familiar with, which is um, the, the need and the imperative need, quite honestly, of mobilizing um, <clears throat> private sector investment in agriculture. Um, in every which way we've made calculations, 
the amount of funds that are moving into development in general and moving into agriculture in particular are not enough for the sort of development outcomes we all uh, are aiming for in terms of um, uh, reducing poverty, in terms of increasing rural incomes, in terms of generating employment, and all, all the associated development outcomes. Um, there are many different calculations out there, but clearly public sector funding and uh, the funding that might come from donors, uh, multilateral organizations falls way short of what we need. Uh, a, a substantial amount of um, resources need to be mobilized from the private sector uh, for the sort of outcomes that we're looking for. But when it comes to you know thinking about how can the mobilize the private sector be mobilized, that's where this concept of the enabling environment comes into the picture, um, which is basically the set of conditions that facilitates, that motivates, that stimulates private sector investment, and not only investment but performance actually. Um, and this enabling environment is composed by different uh, dimensions. Some of them are here in this slide, policies, regulations, institutions, support services, infrastructure, social, social capital, and so many more. These together are the, again, the components of enabling an environment that we need to be thinking of, we need to be analyzing, we need to be improving uh, to provide the necessary conditions uh, for private investment. For this reason, uh, when the World Bank embarked on this, on this project, uh, we thought what sort of evidence is not out there could be provided uh, to facilitate analysis, dialogue, and improvement of, of uh, policies. And one of the areas which seemed to be most critical for the private sector, and one of the areas where there was clearly a gap in terms of evidence, in terms of data, was um, the regu regulatory framework, the legal and regulatory framework. We thought at that time that if we could establish a system that would uh, sort of barometer or dashboard, if you want to call, which would allow um, users to quickly get a sense of how enabling or perhaps how constraining regulations are for the private sector, this could be a great contribution to this policy dialogue globally. And we wanted to develop indicators that could really measure or get a sense of the balance of the regulation in terms of providing all of, um, all of the benefits of these regulations in terms of uh, safety standards, quality standards, information, property rights, environmental safeguards, but at the same time balancing it out with uh, limiting the amount of burden that these regulations impose on the private sector and constrain the private sector, excessive costs, burdensome processes, in movement into informal, informal sectors and reduced access to certain services. Um, <clears throat> we developed a set of indicators that, that have implications along the value chain, right? And in fact, some of them would be of more relevance to suppliers, uh, particularly inputs. You can see in this image that, for example, regulations related to seed and fertilizer and machinery are very relevant for suppliers to be able to perform, to invest. Others, perhaps the majority, relevant to the farmers, to the producers, and others further downstream for processors and distributors. But ultimately, for us, at the heart of this whole equation and uh, the formulation of the indicators were the farmers, right? And we really wanted to make sure that even though we look at um, regulations that have implications for different actors along the value chain, that the farmer is always being impacted, is always kept in mind. So if we were looking at regulations that have implication for seed companies and fertilizer companies, ultimately that had an impact on available and affordable inputs for the farmer. Uh, same thing with veterinary medicine um, and feed 
products, veterinary medicine and uh, medicinal and feed products. Um, at the same time, when we look at uh, phytosanitary, uh, the implications of regulation for phytosanitary offices or pest control offices, that has an implication for farmers. For um, when it comes to access to credit, the regulations have impact on warehouse operators, et cetera, et cetera. So this was really at the heart of what we were thinking. And it's based on this that in our latest report, um, in the 2019 report, which was released just uh, two, three months ago, um, our team was able to develop eight indicators, some of them for inputs, such as seed and fertilizer, uh, water and machinery, others for enablers, such as uh, plant health, food, trade of food, and accessing finance. So we do have in the EBA 2019 these eight indicators. Each one, each one of them has a score for every country. Now, within each of these indicators, we look at two aspects of the regulatory framework. Primarily, we look at the quality of the regulations, what we call the quality regulations, which is basically a reading and assessment of the laws and the regulations and the norms and the provisions that can be found in the books, in the documents of a country. Um, this is what the EBA was founded on. This is what we started off with, and this is the bulk of the information that we provide. But we do look at a second dimension of the regulatory framework, which is, well, uh, what actually happens in practice, which we call efficiency indicators. Not necessarily what's in the books is what is taking place in practice. Now, these are this is an area of uh, that is a little bit more complex to capture. You need different um, sampling methods. So we have less of this information, but the information that we have has proven to be very valuable. And we most definitely want to continue expanding on this area of the practice or efficiency indicators. And interestingly, if I may show you this one slide, these are the 101 countries that we have scores for. You, you can see that there is a relationship between the um, quality, the indicator quality scores, so the quality of the regulations, and the efficiency score. So in general, we get a sense that countries that do have stronger regulations in the books also tend to implement them more efficiently. Now, even though we do have these eight indicators, and please don't be uh, overwhelmed by this slide, I just want you to be aware that uh, EBA goes beyond merely providing indicators and indicator scores. You can see the, in this slide the eight indicators that we have in the different topic areas. Um, naturally, in the seed topic area, we have supplying seed indicator, but in markets, you have actually two indicator areas, one that has to do with the plant health, the phytosanitary conditions, and the other one has to have the food trade, right? Those are, our, those are indicators within each of those topics. But within those topics, we also have quite a rich set of data that goes beyond the indicator um, that describes in more detail some of the regulations outside of the data points that we've used for the indicator and that have proven to be very useful for, for some of the policy dialogue and analysis that countries have been making uh, using EBA. Now, you, just in case uh, you might be interested, where do we get or how do we get our data? We actually um, identify the data points that we're looking for, most of which will shape our indicators, but many of which go beyond the indicators. We put together questionnaires that allow us to capture these data points. We ourselves administer those questionnaires to the public sector in our target countries, to the private sector, to law firms, uh, to CSOs, civil society, academia, basically anybody that we can get uh, in terms of primary actors in those topics or in those sectors within a country. All of this goes through a process. We have uh, over 4,000 respondents to these questionnaires. Goes through a process of review, of validation uh, before we we analyze that data, we code it, and we aggregate it into indicators. 
Um, here, I just wanted to put up a slide uh, to share with you the, the countries that EBA covers in its latest report. So here we have different shades and colors because we've scaled up gradually. We started out with 10 pilot countries, which are in blue here in 2015, went up to 40 countries, which are in purple in 2016. Important thing is uh, now we've added the ones in yellow, and so the total here of 101 countries, very diverse in terms of region, in terms of income groups, so it gives us a good sense of uh, variability um, amongst the countries. And, and the outcome, as I mentioned, has uh, the latest outcome has been our 2019 report. Um, the soft copy can be downloaded from our website, which is eba.worldbank.org. Um, but I, I would say perhaps beyond the, the report itself, which is in a way is just a summary of our findings, the website is, is quite user friendly. You can go in there and look at the data of a, of a single country. You can choose countries and compare them. You can see what are the data points that underpin each of the scores. Um, for those of you working on per any particular country, there are country profiles, meaning uh, all of the data for a single country in each of those topics, both for the indicators and beyond the indicators, those can all be found on the website. So please uh, feel free to use this. Uh, we've had we've seen increasing use of this in policy dialogues uh, in, around the world. Governments and policymakers are using this increasingly as a reference. Now, um, <clears throat> not uh, beyond going into the specific results of this report, I wanted to first give you a sense of where we see the higher scores and where we see the lower scores. And here, We've kind of used different shades to illustrate that, where the darker countries are those that have higher scores. So they reflect regulatory, legal and regulatory frameworks that are more enabling for the private sector. And again, private sector, we're referring to all these actors along the value chain, both large and small. Um, one of the features of our 2019 report, and this is the first time we're doing this, is we're capturing, we're starting to capture the reforms. And you can see that there is um, quite a bit of activity in terms of uh, policy and regulatory reforms. We've captured in, over the last two years, meaning since the 2017 report, 67 report reforms in 47 countries. Uh, we find that Sub-Saharan Africa is the most reforming region. So that's a region where most of the reforms can be found. And interestingly, more than half of the reforms are taking place in three of the areas that we cover, which is seed, plant health, and finance. And you can go into the report and see details of, for example, the number of reforms per each of the areas that we look at or each of the indicators that we have and uh, in which countries these are taking place. And you can see that there's quite a bit of activity taking place here. I wanted to um, <clears throat> quickly give you a sense of, of uh, how these scores can be used. I'm putting up here just one example of uh, Madagascar. So for each country, we'll have the eight scores for each of the indicators. And on the right-hand column, just to give a sense of where those scores stand, the ranking. So where that score falls amongst the 101 countries. And um, here you can see, for example, that uh, uh, there are quite low scores when it comes to inputs, uh, seed, fertilizer, uh, livestock also, except for machinery. Machinery, for example, Madagascar has a higher score. Right? Um, but if I take you to the next slide, you can actually compare these scores with the regional average, which are those blue circles. So that's the average score for Sub-Saharan Africa and the global average, which are the yellow circles, right? And again, Madagascar can quickly get a sense that its scores, which means its regulations for each of those areas uh, are weaker or more constraining in almost all areas, perhaps only a couple areas 
registering machinery, they actually have a very robust set and efficient practices uh, in that area. And, and when it comes to protecting plant health, at least at the African level, they can see that they have a higher score. Now, besides calling the attention of governments and policymakers, how can this be used? For example, if we look at the data, I'm sorry, the score for supplying seed, it's a relatively low score. And then you start um, delving into the data that, that, again, shapes that score, but also goes beyond that score. There's quickly a number of findings, right? There's four areas that, uh, that we can see that require strengthening to, again, facilitate uh, private investment and performance in there. One of them is private sector access to plant genetic material in public gene banks, right? The regulations around that and the practices around that. That is an area of weakness in Madagascar. And we can actually also start determining, well, what are some of the countries that do have those regulations in place and do have those practices in place? And countries such as Ethiopia in, in Africa, Kenya or Uganda, or Zambia, Malawi come to, come to mind. Or even beyond Africa, if Madagascar is interested, can look at cases in Latin America, such as Bolivia, or Panama, or Laos in Southeast Asia. So you see, um, I've listed here four areas of, of weakness based on our data and some examples of countries that can be looked at to uh, kind of um, facilitate cross-country learning. Um, so that's one of the advantages of this. And, and if I can show you just one more slide in this area, this is actually a summary a checklist of all of the regulations or the regulatory areas we look at within SEED. So first of all, we look at three different areas in SEED. We look at plant breeding, variety registration, and SEED quality control, and the regulations around or the key regulations in each of those three areas. Then within those, you can see, and I'm not going to read them off now, but you can see a kind of checklist of aspects that we look at and which one of those are present in a country such as Madagascar, which one of those are absent, those are marked by X's, and which one of those are partially present. Uh, there might be uh, you know, some aspects missing, but others there. And then again, uh, associated to these, the countries where we can find some good practices and we can learn some lessons uh, in these areas. I've also highlighted here those purple ovals is just to say out of this full data set, these are the ones that we use to formulate our scores. But it's just to make sure that uh, users understand that there's much more data than just what shapes the, the indicator score for our country. So that gives you a sense of, uh, of our work, our, um, our report, our methodology, and um, the results, the kinds of results that we obtain and how they can be used. I just wanted to take a few minutes here, and this is something that Samjana had wanted to share with you, just to tell you a little bit more broadly about the use of EBA. The EBA kind of has two, um, two areas of work. One is all the work that leads to producing the report and presenting the evidence, and uh, which we could call upstream. And the other is once the report is in hand, how this is shared to uh, build awareness, to generate interest in, in making changes, in provoking analyses and dialogue, and, and ultimately in supporting reforms. Um, I wanted to tell, talk to you a little bit about this downstream process because it's it's really uh, picked up. Uh, and and this here is a map of countries that have been using EBA to greater or lesser extent for policy processes in their countries. In a number of them, and I'll talk to you about that, actually reforms taking place based on these indicators and based on this data. The ones in yellow are ones that we have coming up around the corner in the next couple of months. The ones in purple, we already have engagement and most of them ongoing engagement around the results of EBA for those countries. In fact, we could, uh, this here is kind of a pipeline of 
countries that are using EBA that they start out by having on the left hand side some sort of dissemination event and activity. Uh, most of those move on and have more technical workshops and discussions. Uh, then uh, a bunch of those actually express formal interest either by incorporating it into their country strategy or some other through some other mechanism forming an entity that can deal with these findings. Um, often an operational or reform project is identified that can fund or support reforms. And finally, on the right-hand side, countries that actually carry out reforms. And you have the two colors uh, because the dark ones have already been completed and the green ones are in process. So let's say uh, in Laos, on the reform side, reforms are taking place but haven't been completed yet. Um, and, you know, if we could quickly make a diagram of the way EBA is being used, here we have it. I won't read this off. Uh, you know, a bunch of countries that are, have reform programs, operational programs in place, operational project programs in yellow, reform programs in green. Um, countries that have incorporated it into their national strategies in red that have government uh, working groups working on these in purple. And uh, finally, in this kind of turquoise color, countries that have had reforms. Um, I think it's, it's interesting to point out here that uh, how uh, governments kind of mobilize different uh, sections or different entities within their government to, uh, to deal with this, to analyze the findings, to integrate them with other data and um, information on other dimensions of the enabling environment, and to even uh, come up with recommendations or prescriptions in terms of um, uh, policy reforms. And here you see some countries designate a, an entity that already exists for example, Cambodia has a technical working group for agriculture and water, and this entity has been, you know, um, kind of assigned to deal with EBA findings. Other countries uh, form a sort of committee or a working group to, to carry out this work. Uh, this is the case, for example, of Kazakhstan or in, in uh, also in uh, uh, Tanzania. Um, just to finish up here, a couple examples of how these, these findings are used for projects. This is the case of, for example, three of the projects that we have here at the World Bank for three countries, Laos, Honduras, and Guinea. Two of them are actually under implementation. So they are already, they have a component that deals with some of the issues raised by EBA. In the case of Laos, they have a component just focusing on the adoption of good seed varieties and another component focusing on broader improvements in the enabling environment for $24 million. And that's using EBA findings uh, to kind of drive some of the actions. Honduras, uh, another component focusing on the regulatory framework uh, for enabling the agribusiness competitiveness. Guinea, uh, that project is under preparation and they're incorporating EBA findings into that. Um, but, you know, quite honestly, we could go country by country uh, to give examples of how different entities within the country or different processes are uh, using this evidence, what they're doing and what it's leading to. All of that, I'm happy to, to share more with you as we go along. Um, I do want to make sure I finish on time here so we have enough time for questions and discussion. So perhaps with that, um, it gives you a good sense of, of the project and what we do, and we can just go ahead and open up for some questions. Over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Fabo. That's very well-timed and um, very interesting presentation. So um, yeah, we've got a few questions have been put in, um, and I had a couple that were submitted before before the event began, um, when we when people were registering for the uh, webinar, so I thought I'll, I'll um, 
I'll probably kick off with those if that's the right fireboard. But just to everyone who's listening, so if you if you haven't yet found the chat box on the left hand bottom, sorry, bottom right hand corner. Did I say left hand at the beginning? I think I did. Bottom right hand corner. Um, you you'll find there. You you can easily put in questions there, and if you tag them as questions, they'll they'll pop up in the Q and A mode. So um, fireboard. Yeah, the, one of the first questions we had was this one. Um, how do we get the questions to pop up on the screen? I think it's like this. There you go. Yeah, so this wasn't this wasn't my question, Firebot. It was actually from um, some an organization called Eco Cooperation. They were they want to know what the main challenges and solutions are in in general in enabling the business agriculture, especially targeting smallholders. Quite a general question, but can you can you speak to that? Of course. Um and, and you're right, it is a very general and very broad question, but perhaps it allows me to talk a little bit about, um, again, the, the theme of thought here as we formulated uh, EBA. Um, so clearly the, the challenges or solutions are at many different levels, right? And that's why I wanted to make sure I illustrate in one of those first slides that the enabling environment for business and agriculture um, depends on a number of of factors that overlay, right? Uh, it's not only policies and regulations, it's also support services, is infrastructure, it's labor force, a, a number of different things. So the short answer is the main challenges or solutions are at all those different levels. Um, and in fact, I might say uh, they vary in country by country. I mean, there might be, uh, we find that in some country, in infrastructure is a much more constraining issue than perhaps laws and regulations, right? Um, the, the overlay or the, the, the mix of, of issues that need to be addressed and the prioritization of those issues varies from one country to another. And that's where we find very interesting the, the fact that as soon as EBA uh, results are issued, it starts these kind of country policy dialogue processes or, or jumps into these country policy dialogue processes and allows us to, at a country level, bring in other data, other considerations, other challenges, but brings to the table the public sector, the private sector, civil society, technical experts, and it kind of engenders this, this joint analysis of, well, what are for this particular country out of all of these issues that have been identified by EBA and by other uh, data groups, what are the main challenges and solutions in that country? So clearly I wouldn't be able to give a, an answer, uh, a general answer, it would be tailored per country, but at least I take advantage of this question to kind of show how this integrates with all sorts of uh, other areas that need to be looked at and and then again, emphasize that uh, all too often the private sector has clarified that many of these challenges are within the regulatory framework of countries. Great, thank you. Uh, a quick one now, just because it's sort of technical one, but how long does it take to collect data from one country and include it in the EBA? Yeah, um, so, I would say the data collection process takes anywhere between three and six months, depending on the level of uh, uh, complexity. You know, I mean, being able to identify the key actors or respondents is one part of the process. Um, getting uh, responses from these respondents is the second part of the process. And then we do a lot of follow-up. Follow we do this often remotely through phone calls. Sometimes we actually travel to the countries. Um, and then comes a kind of follow-up process of validation. All of that takes between three in the easier countries, I would say two to three months in the easier, quicker countries, and up to six months, perhaps even seven in countries where it takes several iterations and, and efforts to be able to collect that information. Um, I take advantage of this question to say, yes, we are fully aware Indonesia is missing and several other countries. And uh, we have been scaling up in time and hope to continue to be able to do that, particularly in demand. And a lot of countries have actually come up to us and demanded and requested that they be included. 
Thank you. So look, on the question of follow-up, um, Kabir wanted to know um, to what extent you, you do follow up and look at how they get value from the document and their local exercises. Yeah, yes, uh, follow-up is a big, big part of the sort of influence and impact we, we aim to have uh, by providing this evidence. Um, you know, one thing perhaps uh, I'll mention a, a couple of points here. One is that uh, in the bank, we have a, kind of a clear idea of the teams that provide the information and make sure the information is understood and can be readily used. And the bulk of what the bank does is actually the investment and the technical assistance that the bank lends uh, at the, you know, in the sector. So when it comes to EBA, we have in a certain way an EBA team, which is the one that you know, is out in the field, uh, making sure that these results are understood, that they fit into a broader policy dialogue. But we work side by side with our operational colleagues, which are the ones who are actually managing um, the funds, managing the projects that EBA is funding. And those are the ones who on a day-to-day -day basis and a longer term are um, working with client countries, working with stakeholders at the country level to make sure that, uh, that uh, these, this evidence is used and can have impact. Uh, so I would say in, in those countries that I had in purple on the slide where there has been engagement, there has certainly been follow-up. There's a lot of activity taking place and the EBA team is working very closely with our agriculture global practice team uh, to make sure that on a regular basis, this is being incorporated into uh, the operations taking place. And now the second point I wanted to mention here is just awareness of the time. You know? um, EBA has been going on for a few years now, but it's only been the last couple of reports, the 2017 report and now the 2019 report that has indicators that allows for, you know, a certain degree of uh, policy impact. So we're very early in the process. You can think that just 2019 report is the first time we actually capture reforms. Um, I think uh, certainly follow-up is, is a part of our, program uh, but it clearly and we've seen the processes it takes a few years before you can actually see impact and see the value of having this evidence on the table and uh, within policy dialogues in, in the different countries so we hope to be seeing in the next couple of years uh, much more of this yeah i mean there's been a couple of questions in this same vein i just want to i put this one up although you have in a sense already answered it from from good I guess um, what's of particular interest to the to the beam exchange uh, community is is how this kind of follow up um, and and influence can be could be tied into the kind of programs and projects that are using market systems development as an approach. Is there a, is there a role for collaboration with um, donor funded projects outside the World Bank? in achieving some sort of influence in terms of reform. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much for this question because uh, yeah, it provides opportunity to kind of highlight the importance of collaboration around these results. So maybe I'll start just um, from a more self-centered view in the sense of, okay, what is EBA itself? How does it mobilize you know, the government and the actors? And, that's where the experience uh, of the bank and not only of the bank, but different entities with uh, global benchmarking indicators uh, comes into play. Clearly, we are, uh, by nature, we like to compare ourselves to others. It helps us get a sense of where we stand, how we're doing. Um, uh, this has been demonstrated in many different spheres of human life, uh, athletics, academics, etc. And and clearly, and there's quite a bit of uh, research has been carried out um, that on the policy level and on um, cross-country learning of policy, the, for countries to be able to compare themselves with others, it's very provocative, right? It's very motivating in many, in many senses. And that's why, you know, there are projects such as 
the doing report that have been quite influential just by putting out there a, a score and a ranking that allows you to compare yourself to other countries. So we think that EBA in its nature and part of the reason that we've generated these kind of synthesized, readily easable and usable indicators, just by its nature really um, mobilizes uh, governments and other stakeholders around some of the evidence that we're presenting. And we've seen that. As soon as we go into a country with, with these results, they are very quick and saying, well, but uh, let me see how the, the neighboring country is doing better in these couple areas. Why are we behind? And what can we learn from another country uh, across the world that, uh, that has higher scores than us in this area? So we hope that this indicator score is a critical tool to get um, the, the decision makers, the policy makers around the table. And that's what we are seeing. However, and this is the second part of, of my answer, um, actually having the reforms take shape, uh, it takes a village, right? I mean, we, the, the intention of EBA is to call the attention of governments and policy makers, but also to bring, generate a dialogue where we can bring uh, collaborators that have a good sense, often a much better sense than all of us, of what's happening on the field. What are, what are some of these, how do some of these findings or how, how, how do some of these constraints that we've identified impact um, value chain actors, right? And so in almost all the countries, EBA has been instrumental for, uh, in generating these technical discussions uh, which brings to the table, again, the private sector and civil society and, and academic experts. It, we've actually worked in Africa very closely with entities such as AGRA, uh, how they are, Green Alliance for, uh, Africa Green Alliance for Agriculture, um, in making sure that we have these platforms set up that all of these stakeholders are around the table, that we discuss these findings and go beyond these type findings. And based on these findings can formulate priority areas uh, and the more critical areas. And that is, these have been the tools that have kind of been leading to implementing reforms. These has been presented to the government, often funded by different entities. Um, in the agri countries, we actually, you know, about uh, seven or eight of them, we have reform programs taking place being funded by AGRA based on the formulations uh, and the consultations of different stakeholder groups around EBA findings. So it gives a sense of kind of a chain of what happens uh, to, to make sure that reforms are implemented and lead to regulatory efficiency. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, all of this takes quite a bit of uh, time and we're eager to see where reforms have taken place and improvements have taken place, eager to see the impact it actually has on the ground and in practice. Mm. Very, very interesting. So look, recognizing the, the, the potential or, or actual influence that this process can have on governments, um, I think we need to get into a couple more more controversial questions. And, I, and I've got a couple lined up for you, so well, if you don't mind, which will sort of talk about um, issues like gender and um, organic agriculture. But just before we get into those questions, I, again, a slight a technical one, but just to be clear, what do you, how do you, um, I mean, Steve Spink want, Mink, Stephen Mink wants to know how you can, can you explain how an indicator gets chosen? Because it seems to me that the choice of indicators that you focus on is going to be quite important. Yes, absolutely. And uh, time and again, we are told uh, <laughs> that, uh, or, or the comment is raised that, uh, you know, why isn't this indicator area included or would it be possible to include another indicator area? And the very valid actually comments and observations. So um, the way the indicator, well, let me, let me actually start by saying that um, we have to remember that EBA is a global indicator set. So perhaps we'll start by mentioning that we make sure we look at indicators that are relevant and of the highest relevance uh, all over the world, right? So, so there might be, if we would have to, and we have had consultations on this, if we would have to develop an indicator set tailored to Africa, tailored to Latin America, perhaps uh, the selection would, would vary a bit. 
um, but we want to make sure these are grow globally relevant. Now, second thing is there is a certain uh, set of resources that we have to work with. We can't cover all areas or even all important areas. So there's had to be a selection of indicator areas based on the available resources, which is why we've limited ourselves to eight to 10 to date. Uh, but I mean, um, uh, I would say if there were more, more resources, naturally we would be able to cover more areas. Now, how are the ones that are there, how have they been prioritized or selected? It's, it's been actually a number of uh, kind of processes inside of the bank and in consultation between the bank and different agencies and including the donors of the project. Um, the area of land has actually is within the selection, just to, just to clarify that. Um, we have just given us ourselves time to develop some of these indicators, livestock indicators were presenting for the first time in the 2019 report. It wasn't there before. Uh, land, we have been collecting data and looking at different issues to date, but we feel that we don't have what we need uh, to be able to formulate indicators yet. However, it is in our, in our agenda. It will probably be added as we move forward, but particularly because it's a very critical and sensitive area, we've wanted to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what are the areas or issues we need to focus on uh, that are represent a good proxy, because these are all ultimately, these are all good proxies of a regulatory, broader regulatory framework in a specific area. So we are moving in that direction, but certainly there are areas, I mean, um, post-harvest uh, management, labor. I mean, there's a number of areas that we feel that we haven't been able to get to contract farming, um, but that are on the top of our minds and to the degree that we can uh, and our resources allow for it, we will incorporate as we move forward. Uh, Mike, you had also mentioned the question of uh, women. Yes, and also- Yeah, Janet, so there was this, this question just... that we had. Yeah, please do. Can we, let's, can we talk about gender? Sure, of course, of course. Um, so perhaps one of the things I didn't include in my presentation, but should have, is that even though we have these topic areas, uh, which are kind of the pillars or the components of the EBA indicators, we do have two topic areas, which we refer to as cross-cutting. Uh, one of them is gender and the other is environmental sustainability. So what we want to say is that across all of these areas of inputs and enablers, um, we are interested in making sure that we provide data that also demonstrate how uh, gender inclusive, woman inclusive uh, regulatory framework is in countries and how environmental or to what degree it uh, encourages uh, sustainable practices. Um, now, we don't have indicators or indicator scores for these areas, which doesn't preclude the fact that we might have them. We might be able to you know, formulate some in the future. But what we have provided in both of these areas, uh, based on a number of data points in, within each of these topic areas on gender or within each of these topic areas within environmental sustainability, is, uh, is an analysis, right? It is an analysis of some of those issues that countries are facing that could be, uh, in, in terms of regulations, could be constraining women in agriculture or could be um, constraining sustainable practices in those countries. And, you know, just to talk about um, gender, for example, we look at in gender in our um, uh, finance topic, uh, in our fertilizer topic, in our transport topic, in our uh, markets, we have producer organizations. We have a number of data points that actually look into how restrictive uh, the regulatory framework is for women or how enabling or promoting the, the regulatory framework is for women. And we collect all those data points from those areas and can make a you know, country level analysis of what women face. Uh, in agriculture in, in general. We don't look at any particular uh, data points in agricultural trade. 
uh, meaning that we haven't been able to find within the regulatory framework specific policies or regulations that that constrain trade and oh, I'm talking particularly about cross-border trade but we do when it comes to producer organizations we have a set of data related to the formation the registration and the operation of producer organizations and we have a number of data points that inquire into you know uh, women participation I mean can they be part of the producer organization? Can they register? Can they actually form part of the uh, board of directors and directors of the organization? Are there any mechanisms to promote the participation of women in these uh, producer organizations and in their leadership? And these uh, certainly have implication on, you know, again, the participation of women in agricultural trade, because when it, particularly when it comes to domestic trade, these producer organizations have an important role in, within Africa in particular. So um, that's how we've been confronting it. Uh, and that would be my answer to that question. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. So Farbod, I, mean, I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but given what you were saying earlier about the, the, the sort of psychological influence of, of, of rankings and how, how powerful that can be as a motivator, wouldn't having some sort of indicators around public indicators around gender or indeed around environmental sustainability of agriculture be quite a win of, uh, as an opportunity or is it is it too politically controversial no for sure i, I don't think um i mean we would be happy to actually uh, shape an indicator a score around this um, i think it comes down to a methodological issue of the number of data points that we have and to what degree they're a proxy of the you know, broader environment for, let's say, women to participate in agriculture. Um, and, uh, and if they're representative, well, that's basically what proxy is, they're representative of, of recommendations uh, that can be done at the policy level in that area. So it's more of a methodolo methodological issue to make sure that whatever data points we collect can be expressed an indicator score that in fact can be used to, to, to score the country in that area. But we have been moving in that direction every time we have a bigger set of data and we are, we're starting to kind of see how they might come together to, to shape a robust and kind of consistent, coherent actually, a coherent indicator for those two areas which are so diverse, right? I mean, let's say even in environmental sustainability, what does that mean? You can be so environmental sustainable in one area or have regulations that promote in one area, but not in another. So what does it mean if you give a score for environmental sustainability to a country, right? I mean, the, it's, it's more on that area that we're trying to figure things out uh, and move in that direction that you suggest. Thank you. That's a very helpful answer. Um, this, this question from Stephen Mink might also perhaps relate to that, and he's asking whether there are any academic or analytical efforts to empirically assess the relationship of these scores, of the, the relationship between these scores and outcomes, whatever those might be. Um, how, how are you, are you, is this on your, on your agenda or are you just too busy collecting and analyzing the data yourself? <laughs> Uh, for sure, it is on our agenda, and ultimately, it explains the whole reason of why we're doing what we're doing, and justifies why we should uh, continue doing this. Um, our challenges have been a few. So, let me first answer by saying yes, it is definitely um, on our agenda. Uh, there are, there have been efforts, and we, you know, we're planning to have even more efforts. In fact, uh, within these next few months, um, last couple of months, we've been formulating EBA's third phase. So what EBA will look at after this year. And for that, we're, we're carrying out or planning some of these assessments. Now, there's a few issues. One is it's taken a while to build up uh, the data set that we have to date and finally reach also a sample of 100 countries. Um, it was much more difficult to do this sort of work with 40 countries. With 62 countries, we started really uh, moving into this territory. And now with 100 countries, we feel much more empowered to be able to do this. Um, <clears throat> second of all, 
the whole issue of reforms is also a big part of this picture. Not only do we want to see relationships between the scores and outcomes, but we want to see relationships, relationships between changes in the scores uh, due to reforms and changes in the outcomes, right? Um, so for the first time, we have data for a couple of years of reforms and we're, we're wanting to use those to be able to carry out these studies. Now, having said that, we have been actually um, carrying out some regressions. Some of them are actually in the report that shows the, the correlation between EBA scores and <clears throat> certain output or outcome variables. Some of them are closer to the actual regulations. So for example, in the 2017 report, you'll see that machinery scores, uh, EBA machinery scores are directly correlated with the, um, the density of tractors in a country, right? And we've carried out these regressions in the number of areas with some of those kind of early outcome variables. So what is the relationship between fertilizer scores and availability of, of fertilizer or um, seed scores, particularly around variety registration and the number of varieties that is registered. So these are regressions that we've been looking into. Um, but others are a little bit more distant. So going back to fertilizer, what is the, what is the relation between fertilizer scores and fertilizer use? Now, as we get farther away, it becomes uh, much more noisy. You can imagine these, these regressions becomes more noisy. And so it takes a lot more nuancing and it takes more data to be able to dig down a little deeper. Um, but Again, back to the question, we are moving in this direction. We're very interested in this sort of work. With the latest iteration of the, of the report, we have a renewed kind of efforts to do, carry out some of these studies and, um, and hope that these will give a better sense of uh, the relation between EBA scores and some of the outcome levels that we're looking for. Well, that's excellent. Well, look, um, we've come to the end of the questions pretty much and also the end of our time. And I just want to say very much, I want to say thank you very much, Fabos, for ha handling it so um, smoothly. And um, we, we were very sorry not to have your colleague Samjana join us, but actually you, um, you've done an excellent sterling job in terms of covering the material and, and speaking in a very um, articulate and clear way. I think everyone would have very much enjoyed what you had to say. Um, before we say goodbye, Farbod, and I give you a final word, I just want to remind everyone that we are very keen to get your feedback, your comments on the webinar in general. So my colleague uh, Isabel will post a link in the chat box in a moment, which should enable you to give to, to just spend 30 seconds and give us a, a bit of feedback on what you thought, what we can do better in terms of running these events. Um, and also just say, keep an eye out for future webinars we've got another one coming up in only two weeks which is very much focused on gender and women's uh, economic empowerment um, this this webinar uh, will, has been recorded and will be published along with the slides on the, on the beam exchange website the link will be available um, again in the feedback uh, you get an, you'll get an email from Isabel um, later with uh, with a link to the web page which will contain that the recording. So if you want to pass it on to any of your colleagues, you want to forward it to people, recommend that people listen, please do. We, we often get um, much more sort of take up and uh, an audience for these events afterwards than we do actually live. Um, but for those, those of you who did turn up live, thank you very much and for posting some really excellent questions. Um, so we've, we, are, we are at the end of our time. Farbod, can I give you a final word of anything you'd just like to say before we leave? Yes, thank you, Mike. I mean, besides just uh, my gratitude to Beam Exchange for for this occasion, perhaps a, a cordial invitation to all the listeners and participants to reach out if in any way or form you would like to participate in some of the engagement that this is uh, generating at the country level or even at the regional level, please uh, do let us know. We, we are in this together and would like to, to be working with our um, partners and, and colleagues uh, in, in 
discussing some of these findings and making sure that it does have the sort of impact that we're looking for. So a warm invitation to everybody and thank you very much for having the opportunity to share this with you.